Hi everybody, it's Mario here. In today's session, we're gonna be implementing Conway's Game of Life, which is a popular programming exercise to do just to sharpen your skills. Our version is gonna be implemented in Ruby 2D. So let's have a look and see how Conway's Game of Life works. So Conway's Game of Life is not necessarily a game per se, it's more a simulation um, of uh, cells. So I'm looking at the um, article here on Wikipedia and the first thing you might notice is the uh, animation here on the right. So the way that Conway's Game of Life works is we have a grid of cells and those cells can either be uh, alive, um, which are the um, dark colored cells here, um, or dead, um, which are the cells that um, are off. And then there's a set of rules that determines in the next frame that we generate, will the cell um, be dead or alive based on its current status um, and also what its neighboring cells are doing. So having a look at the rules here, there's a few different scenarios to go through. So I'm gonna run through these four here. So the first three rules deal with a cell that's already alive. So when you start uh, the Conway's Game of Life, you need to seed it with some data. So we need to pre-select which cells are gonna be alive. Um, and then when we start the simulation, then we'll look at those existing cells and figure out what the next frame should be. So the first three rules are for live cells. So a live cell with fewer than two neighbors dies um, because it doesn't have the community to support it. If a cell has two or three neighbors, um, it'll be alive for the next frame or if the cell has more than three neighbors, it dies. So it's kind of simulating um, the community around you. If you get the right uh, number of um, cells that are alive, you continue. If you've got too many or too little, um, then that cell will die. The last rule is just around um, cells that are currently not alive, so the dead cells. So um, if we have a cell that's not alive and it has three neighboring cells which are alive, then the next frame it will um, become alive. So you can shorten the rules uh, like this. So any live cell with two or three neighbors survives, any dead cell with three neighbors exactly survives, um, or sorry, becomes uh, alive. And then in all other cases, a cell will remain dead or become dead. The cool thing uh, about Conway's Game of Life is um, when you create the alive cells to begin with, depending on the pattern that you create, you can create these really amazing uh, things. So um, if you have a look here in the uh, center, there's a thing called a pulsar, and you can see it's a pretty intricate pattern, and this one's actually a repeating one. And there's certain um, shapes that will also move across the screen, um, which we'll be able to see. So here you can see this is a pretty basic one under spaceships here. Um, a glider, so that will kind of move through. You can see that scrolling. So it'd be really cool. We can, once we've built it, uh, we can plug in some different starting uh, patterns and then see what happens. So let's have a look um, and see what our program will be like once we've finished. This is our completed program. So you can see it's got a grid there. We can click and set our starting pattern. So I'm gonna just draw out a few different little shapes. Okay, and then I'm gonna press the P key on the keyboard just to play the game. And you can see it starts animating. I'm press P again just to pause. Um, so at any time I can also just add more uh, squares. And you can see it's using those rules around the current state of the cell and the neighbors to kind of figure out the next frame. Each time we run this program as well, it generates a different uh, color. So if I rerun it here, you should be able to see it's just randomly picked a color. Well, this one's quite nice. And then the last feature we have is we can clear it by pressing the C key on the keyboard. So let's have a look at some code. To begin with here, we've got our Ruby 2D program. At the moment, all we're doing is we're setting the background color and then just showing the window. And if we run that, we get this uh, blank page. So we're gonna draw our grid first. We're gonna have grid lines going down the page. 
So let's specify a few things. So we're going to set the, um, the size of each of the squares on the grid. And we'll start maybe with 40 pixels. That'd be nice and large, easy to see. And we'll set our width and height to a multiple of those. So this will be 16 wide and 12 high. Okay, so the window is the same size, but it means now we can easily tweak that by changing these numbers. The next thing we're going to do is create a grid class to hold the logic for our grid. And we're going to have a method on this grid class to draw out each of the lines. So we're going to have a line separating each of the cells. There will be a really faint line we'll draw. Let's put that into a method. And what we're going to do is we're going to uh, get the width of the page. So window dot width, divide that by our square size. Uh, do So this will be um, X. So how many squares we have along the horizontal axis. For each one of them, we will draw a new line. We will set the width to one, the color. It's going to be a light color just so we don't see it too much. Uh, let's pick gray. And now we need to pick um, for our line. We have some starting X coordinates and some uh, X and Y coordinates and a finish X and Y coordinate. So X1, X2, Y1, Y2. So because they're vertical lines, our Y um, values are fairly straightforward. So we start at the top of the page, our Y0 and that's our y1 and our y2 uh, is the bottom of the uh, window so window.height um, our x we're going to use um, this value here and multiply it by the square size so our x will be uh, x1 rather will be x times square size we will have an X2 as well, and it will be the same. So these are vertical lines going down the page. Let's see if we can draw that. I'm going to create a new grid. And each uh, update frame, we're going to clear the screen. And then we're going to draw our grid lines. Excellent. So. That's our vertical lines. We just need to do the same thing now for the horizontal lines. So we're just going to duplicate this. We're going to go through the height and this will now be Y. And these X and Y values will change. So the X1, we're going to start on the left side, so zero, and then the finishing X will be the right hand side of the screen, which will be the width of the window. And then for the Y values, uh, they're going to change based on this current Y. So we'll multiply Y, Y by the square width, the square size. Okay, let's see our grid now. Okay, I'm just missing an end that might be here. Excellent. So that's our grid drawn. The next thing for us to do is to be able to click on these squares and to turn them alive. So let's see if we can do that. So we're going to listen to the mouse down event. And that will allow us to figure out when the mouse is clicked and it will give us the X and Y coordinates of where it was clicked from this event object here. So we can call a method. We haven't implemented this yet. We will in a minute, but we'll call the set method. And the set method will take an X and a Y on our grid. So we'll get the X of the event. And if we divide it by the square size, then we'll know the index, the X index of the cell that we've clicked on. And we can do the same thing for our Y. Okay. So let's just add a method to our grid. We'll call it set. 
and we'll take an X and Y. For the moment, we'll just print out, uh, click X, Y, Y. Okay. And we'll see what happens. So I'm going to click on the top left corner and you can see it's correctly showing that I'm clicking on coordinate zero, zero. If I click one in both X and Y, I should get one, one and uh, for any number of that. So that looks like it's working well. Now that we have our X and Y indexes for where we're clicking, we can now store that information in the grid to figure out which cells are going to be alive. So when we have our new grid, we're going to hold on to each of the alive coordinates. To do that, we're going to do it in a hash. You can implement this many different ways. So you could use an array or another data type, or you could even use a different class to, each, to store each cell, but we're going to keep it simple and use a hash in this case. When we call set, we want to add to our grid hash. Now we only actually care about the key. So the key will be the array of the coordinates, X and Y. The value we don't really care about so much. I'm going to just set it to true. Um, and we're going to be able to figure out if we have an alive cell based on whether or not the uh, coordinates actually exist in the grid uh, rather than its value here. So let's see if we can draw these out. We're going to need a new method to draw them out. I'm going to call it draw alive squares. And we're going to need to loop through each of the entries in the grid. Now, again, we only care about the keys. So I'm going to call keys, which will give me an array of the keys. We're going to loop through and we're going to have an X and a Y uh, come out. So we're going to draw a square for each of the entries for our live cells. We'll color it in so we can see it. And we will set the X and Y coordinates. So it'll just be the X we're given times the square size. And Y will be the same. And lastly, we need a size, which will be our square size. And so now each frame, we will call this draw live squares on our grid. Okay, let's test that out. Okay. I'm going to click on one of the squares and then you can see that they're highlighting, which is great. And we can draw whatever shapes we'd like. The one thing we can't do is I can't turn off one of these um, already alive cells. So when we click rather than setting the value, uh, it should actually toggle it um, based on uh, the current state. So let's see if we can do that. Let's see if we can implement turning these off once they clicked again. Okay, so rather than calling the set method, we're just gonna change the name to indicate that we're actually toggling. So we'll call it toggle. And we'll rename this here to match toggle. And now we need to check to see if it's already in our grid. So we're gonna say, does the grid have this key. So it has key and we'll pass in our key, which will be the X and Y array. And if it is already there, then we actually want to delete the entry. So grid.delete X and Y. If it's not, then we're going to do the same thing. Okay. So now you can see it's working well. So I can turn these on and I can turn them off. Our next step now is going to be animating the game. So showing the next frame. Before we calculate that next frame, we need some way of turning on uh, the, the, the game. So when you initially set it up, you'll click on the fields that you want to live and then you'll press a button and then it will start to animate. So we're gonna make that the P uh, key. So P for pause and play. So we're gonna implement that um, first before we move to the logic for calculating the next frame.
So the first thing here is to add our key listener. So when we press a key on the keyboard, we will run some code and we need to check the key because we only want the P key. So if the event key is P, then we're going to um, do something to our grid. So we want to change it from a pause state to a playing state. It's going to start out paused. We press P, it'll start playing. We press it again, it'll pause. So let's call it play pause. And let's implement that now in our grid. When we initialize our grid, we're going to set a playing state to false. And then when we call this play pause method, it's going to just flip it. So if it's currently false, it'll be true and vice versa. So we'll say the playing uh, variable gets set to whatever the current variable is not. So the exclamation mark there will give us the opposite. Now that we know if our um, uh, grid is playing, it can now decide whether or not it needs to um, animate. So let's call some code to animate the grid. We probably don't want to animate the grid every single frame because if we do, it's going to be really fast. We're not going to be able to see what's happening very well. We're going to need to slow it down. So in Ruby 2D, we get a count of how many frames are drawn. If our refresh rate on our monitor is 60 hertz, like most of them are, um, we can draw four times per second um, by uh, getting the remainder of divided by 20. When that's zero, we know it's every fourth frame. Uh, I've had to play around four frames per second seems like a reasonable amount. We can still see what's happening um, and it doesn't uh, advance too slowly. So when that happens, we're going to call a method on our grid uh, and we'll call that advance frame. So we haven't made that yet. That's where we'll put our logic um, for animating our, uh, animating our grid. Let's run that code and see what happens. And you can see we're getting an error advanced frame, uh, which we expect. So that's the next thing to implement. Let's add our method, our advanced frame method to our grid class. And we're gonna only advance if we're playing. Okay, so I'm gonna run the program again. And it shouldn't try and run that method. It's only when we click on the, uh, when we press P, it'll start advancing. So let's talk about calculating our uh, next frame. So let's take this um, alive uh, point as an example. So the rules that we have for Conway's Game of Life states that if this cell is alive, it will continue to be alive if two of its immediate neighbors, um, two or three of its immediate neighbors are alive. So the way this currently is, this cell that we have will die in the next frame. If it has one neighbor, it'll still die. But if it has two neighbors like this, then this uh, cell will continue on. If we have three neighbors as well, it'll continue on. But as soon as it has four, it's going to um, not survive till the next frame. So the next frame wouldn't mean that this one gets removed. So if it's alive, then it needs two or three neighbors. What about if it's not alive? How does it get turned back on? So it will get turned back on if it has exactly three neighbors. So in this case, this one here will be uh, alive in the next frame. So if it's not alive, has three neighbors, it will get turned alive in the next frame. So those are the two main things that we need to program for. If it's alive and it has either two or three neighbors, it survives. Or if it's not alive, and it has exactly uh, three neighbors, then um, it will uh, turn alive for the next frame. And as you can see, each um, cell has eight neighbors. So all the way going from top left around in a circle um, through this left one here. So let's write some code to calculate the next frame. So to calculate our next frame, we're gonna create a new grid hash. And then once we've done our logic, we're going to replace the existing grid with our new grid. So the first thing we'll do is create this hash and we'll populate that as we kind of loop through um, all of the squares that we need to calculate. 
So we're going to need to go through every single visible square that we have and calculate um, its neighbors. So let's do that. So I'm going to get the width of the window, divide it by the square size. And so we're going to loop through for each of the X uh, coordinates that we have. And then inside that, we also need to loop once again for uh, the height, the vertical, um, uh, uh, the vertical uh, cells. And so now we're going to be looping through for every single cell on our entire uh, screen. So the first thing we need to do is calculate whether the current cell we're looking at at the given X and Y coordinates is alive. So let's create a variable. It's going to be called alive. And its value is going to be based on whether the grid, the existing grid, has um, that key defined. So if it exists on this uh, grid, then we know it's currently alive. The next bit of information we need to do is calculate how many of its neighbors are also alive. And with those two bits of information, it, our current state, if we're alive or dead, and how many neighbors we have alive, we can figure out the next state for the current cell. So let's create an array with all of the states of the uh, current neighbors. So I'm going to call it alive neighbors. Any okay. And let's write out what the uh, neighbors we have are relative to our current position. So we have the top left. We're going to go in a clockwise cir circle. We have top, we have top right. We have right, we have bottom right, we have uh, bottom, and we have left. So we should have eight of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Very good. And now what we're going to do is we're going to check the grid at each of those values. So we're going to call has key that'll return whether or not this is alive um, or not. And we need to give the X and Y coordinates for each of our neighbors. So we can use our current coordinates and then um, either take away one or add one based on where um, it is relative to us. Um, so first one, top left, what's the X value? So top left, the X is um, negative one from where we are because we're going left and uh, Y negative one because uh, we're going uh, up. So the value here will be X take one, Y take one. Okay. Um, and that will give us um, the top left. I'm going to copy this uh, for each of them and we'll just tweak the X and the Y values. Okay, so uh, top left, X take one, Y take one for the top. Our X doesn't cha change, but our Y is still top uh, negative one. Top right, it's X plus one, and our um, Y is still negative one. For our right, it's X plus one, and our Y is the same. Uh, bottom right um, is X uh, take one. Sorry, that should be, yes. Bottom right is Yes, x plus one, um, and it should be y plus one. Same with that one and that one. Okay, so there was a few little errors in our x and y uh, coordinates. I believe that's now correct, so we'll see how we go. Um, so now we're correctly uh, figuring out which of our neighbors are alive. And this alive neighbors will be an array with uh, true and false values. So we want the number of alive neighbors we have. And to do that, we're going to call count here and pass in true. So we want to know how many of them um, are set to true. Now that we have that, that's the two bits of information we need to figure out if our cell will be alive for the next, uh, next frame. So now we can set um, our cell if it matches those conditions to be in the new grid. So we'll add a condition here. So there's two things we want to check. So the alive circumstance, so if 
we're alive and the alive neighbors is between, so it's either two or three, then we should uh, persist to the next. Uh, we should be alive in the next frame. Alternatively, if we're not alive and our alive neighbors is exactly three, then we will also be alive. So in that case, we will add a new entry to the new grid and we'll set it to true. And then the last thing for us to do is to replace our current grid with the new grid. So I'm going to say grid equals new grid. Okay. Okay, I've just missed a end here. Let's add that in. Okay, let's see if it works. So I'm going to set a few little patterns. And let's press P. Cool. So at any time I can press P and then I can add some more in and press P again and you can see it resumes. So you can see based on the start pattern, you can get quite a lot of different variations. Sometimes as well, they finish um, and some keep on going forever. So it's just a fun little thing to experiment with and see what you come up with. So there's a few little things we're gonna do just before we wrap up. One nice thing to have would be a button to clear the screen. So if you press the C key on the keyboard, we're gonna make it so the screen clears. So let's do that real quick. We're gonna update our key down uh, event handler here. So if you press the C key, then we're going to clear the grid. Let's implement this method here on our grid. And by clearing, all we need to do is to empty this uh, grid hash. Okay, I'm gonna set a few things. I'm gonna press P, I'm gonna stop it, and then I'm gonna press C. And you can see that uh, I can clear it at any time by pressing C. The last thing we're going to do is we're just going to brighten it up a little bit. We're going to add some different colors and the colors will be randomly generated each time we run the program. Let's do that. In Ruby 2D here, rather than giving it a name of a color, we can just say random. And then we can also randomly generate a color uh, to use with each of our cells, each of our squares and also maybe a different color for the grid lines. So I'm gonna call it line color and we'll say color.new random and we'll also have our square color. Okay, so this is what we're going to update. Um, we're going to put our line color here and same for down here. and then the square color here. Let's have a look. Cool. So it's gonna randomly generate each time. The You might find some color combinations just don't look very good. They might have a poor contrast. So um, in that case, you can just rerun the program like this and you get a different uh, set of colors. Oh, let's see. Oh, very cool. I like this one. All right, I'm gonna add a little bit of pattern here. Awesome. So that's it. That's Conway's Game of Life written in Ruby 2D. Um, this is a pretty um, a simple way to model the program. A lot of people get um, really technical in terms of what classes you make and what methods you have. And uh, it's a bit of an exercise just to practice your coding skills. So um, if you're keen, have a go yourself. Um, if you'd like to have a look at the code, the description has a link below um, to GitHub. 
as well as the article about Conway's Game of Life. If you enjoy this session, then um, please like the video and consider subscribing to the channel. And I should have some new content out in the next few weeks. Thank you very much.